Hello, and welcome to my proof for the Twin Primes Conjecture. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the Twin Primes Conjecture will recognize that this is quite an audacious claim, but I'm hoping that um, in this video I'll be able to give you sort of an overview of the proof that I came up with, and uh, I will also provide a link to this paper that you're seeing on screen, so you're welcome to, of course, check my work and make sure that it's all sound and things like that. But at this point in time, I'm fairly confident that even if I haven't gotten it, I've at least gotten close enough that smarter people than I will be able to uh, take it from there. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Trim Trimes Conjecture, it is a, a hypothesis in mathematics which says uh, that there are infinitely many twin primes, that is, consecutive primes, which are two apart from one another. So 3 and 5, 5 and 7, so on and so forth. Um, this has been an open question uh, since at least 1849, when it was posited uh, in a more general form by uh, a man named de Polignac, and, but the, it's never been proven uh, since then. Um, so I'm hoping today, like I say, to give you an overview of the way in which I believe I have finally discovered a proof for it. Uh, so this will be just an overview. Uh, I will be sort of keeping it a little light on details just for the sake of time, but as I say, uh, the, this, a link to this paper will be in the description for you to peruse at your own discretion. So firstly, uh, I define these terms a hexadjacent, or a hexa for short, and that is any integer of the form 6x plus or minus 1. Uh, and Technically speaking, this could be a positive or a negative integer, but since we're talking about primes, we're really mostly concerned with cases where x is a natural number. That is, it has to be a positive uh, integer. And in addition to that, there is also the anchor of a given hexa, and that is that 6x to which it is adjacent. And then the number x is the referent of that hexa. So in the example I give, 11 equals 6 times 2 minus 1. So 11 is a hexa that is anchored to 12, 6 times 2, and its referent is 2, because that's the number you multiply by 6. Now it may be worth noting that a referent actually corresponds to a pair of hexes. So 11 and 13 both have an anchor of 12 and a referent of 2. Now, why are hexes important? Well, many mathematicians will be familiar with the fact that these are the only class of integers which are even possible to be primes. Uh, and I put a version of Euler's proof for that statement in there, uh, but as I say, that is uh, a pretty well-known uh, bit of trivia about primes in general. Uh, but uh, it also follows from that that a pair of twin primes has to share a referent and an anchor. Right, so you'll never have a pair of twin primes which have different anchors and referents. Now this is useful because it means that we can detect twin primes just by looking at the anchors and referents. Now to that end I created this chart where on uh, this axis here in purple, uh, those are the anchors. And then uh, on the top in blue, those are the hexes. And each cell is filled with the remainder of the anchor mod the hexa. So 18 is 3 mod 5. In particular, we're interested in those cells which contain either a 1 or h minus 1, where h is the hexa in that column. Uh, and why is that? Well, that indicates that one of the two hexes adjacent to that anchor is divisible by that hexa. So for example, 36 is congruent to 1 mod 5, which means that 36 minus 1 is divisible by 5, because it's congruent to 0. And that, of course, is 35 in this example. Now you may notice uh, some regularity in, the, in which cells are colored here. Um, and if we, we can transfer this graph into, instead of looking at anchors, we can change it into reference. Uh, and get a, a bit more of a concise picture of exactly which reference are those which have that divisibility property. Now, one of these cells, which is colored in, I refer to that as an instance of that hexa. So 4 uh, contains an instance of 5, but it does not contain an instance of 7. And an anchor, or a referent, 
which has an instance of a given hexa is invalid with respect to that hexa. Otherwise, it is valid. And it is invalid in general if it is invalid with respect to at least one hexa. So 4 is invalid because it's invalid with respect to 5, even though it is valid with respect to 7. So we are particularly interested in which reference are invalid. Or more specifically, which ones are valid, but it's easier to track which ones are invalid. Well, thankfully, there's a nice simple rule for tracking which reference are invalid with respect to a given hexa H. So a referent R is invalid with respect to H if R is congruent to plus or minus the referent of H. So 4 is congruent to minus 1 mod 5, so it is invalid with respect to 5. But it is not congruent to plus or minus 1 mod 7, which means that it is valid with respect to 7. So with this, we have a relatively easy way of calculating exactly which reference are invalid or valid with respect to a particular hexa. So next we want to break this graph down into something that's a little bit easier to analyze, uh, and so we can sort of heuristically gather information about valid and invalid reference, uh, and in particular how those change as we examine greater and greater portions of this graph. So to that end, for one round of our analysis, we define one hexa as a delimiting hexa. And then we take the referent of the square of that hexa and call that the critical area. So for example, if we take 11 as our delimiter, the referent of 11 squared is 20. So we're looking at this region here, like pretty much the, what's in this graph. Now this particular region, the critical area, is special because within this region we can ignore any instances of hexas which are greater than our delimiter. So in this whole portion of the graph we don't have to worry about any of these instances that are uh, of hexas which are greater than 11. We only have to worry about instances of 5, 7, and 11 uh, in this whole region. And not only that, but in general we can ignore composite hexas because if something is divisible by a composite hexa, it's also, of course, going to be divisible by its prime factors. So within the critical area, delimited by some hexa H, we only need to check for divisibility by prime hexas which are less than or equal to H. And that gives us a way to subdivide this graph and only look at a particular portion at once, and we can then talk about what happens as we expand our critical area. To that end, we want to get a sort of approximation for how many valid reference there are in the critical area. We can do that by recognizing that at each referent, we can look at the combination of remainders of the hexas in question. So if we go down a step, and we're talking about 5 and 7, and we want to look at 10. Instead of thinking about 10, we can call it 0, 3, because 10 is congruent to 0 mod 5 and 3 mod 7. Now, because we're only looking at prime hexas, the Chinese remainder theorem guarantees that every combination will show up once per cycle, which means that the total number of possible combinations is just the product of the hexas we're considering. So in this case, for just 5 and 7, there are 35 total combinations, and each one appears once per cycle. The next question to ask is how many of those are valid? Well. We mentioned earlier that a referent is invalid with respect to some hexa H if and only if it is congruent to plus or minus the referent of H, which means that there are two possible remainders which are invalid, and that leaves H minus two remainders which are valid. So that means that instead of just the product of the hexas, we now have the product of the hexas minus two each. So we have 5 minus 2 is 3, and 7 minus 2 is 5, total of 15 valid combinations. Now that first product of just the hexas, I call the greater prime hexorial, because it is very similar to the primorial function, uh, except we're only looking at prime hexas. It's basically primorial, except we're excluding 2 and 3. And then the second function, where we subtract 2 from each hexa before we multiply them, I call the lesser prime hexorial. The ratio between these two, the lesser over the greater prime hexorial, will give us a rough approximation of how many valid indices there are in a given area. So the critical area of 7 uh, is at uh, the referent 8, 
our approximation would be 15 over 35 times 8, which is about 3.4. So from that, we would guess that 3 or 4 reference are valid with respect to both 5 and 7. And if we look here, we see 1, 2, 3, 4. It matches pretty closely. And I go into this in the paper, but I managed to show that we can be sure that our approximation is no more than n away from the true value if n is the number of hexes under consideration. So that means in our case where we're only looking at two hexes, our basic approximation of 15 over 35x, it, it is no more than two away from the true value. So as I said, the value at 8 is about 3.4, so we know that the true value cannot be more than 5.4, and it cannot be less than 1.4. Now this means that if we go up one hexa, and now we include 11, we have a new approximation, and the error is now plus or minus 3 in either direction, and that'll give us a new amount of valid reference. If we're to show that the twin primes conjecture is true, we want to be able to show that when we do this, we, we increase the number of hexes under consideration in a particular prime hexes, then the total approximation has to increase. Now in order to show this, we can get a little creative with geometry here, where uh, here I have an example of two consecutive uh, critical areas and approximations and so on and so forth. So in blue here, this is the lower bound on the approximation for the first delimiter, which it can be anything. It doesn't even have to be a prime because the approximation and error only account for primes. So if it includes non-prime, then it actually doesn't change the error and approximation in question, only the critical area. So in this particular example, I have the critical area as uh, that of 25. And then for the second one, we have the error and the approximation uh, here in red, and the critical area for 29 over here. So what we're interested in is there is some point x where the approximation and error for the second uh, delimiter, in this case 29, is equal to the value of that of the first delimiter at the critical area. right? And uh, we can actually be sure that this point x, whatever it is, it is greater than the uh, critical area of the first approximation, uh, just because the second approximation is going to be lower uh, than the, uh, the first approximation for all positive values, which is the only domain we really care about. Um, so, once we find this point x where the second approximation has the same value, then we show that the critical area occurs after x, and because this line has a positive slope, that therefore means that uh, at the critical area of the second approximation, it has to have a higher value than uh, does the critical area of the first approximation. Uh, so basically, by doing this, we show that no matter what, the, uh, the approximation, the lower bound on the approximation, including the error, the worst case error, has to increase over time as n goes to infinity. Uh, and so that basically means that if there was some finite maximum number of twin primes, then eventually this lower bound on the approximation would, over, would overtake it. Uh, and so it can't be the case that there is a finite maximum pair of twin primes. Therefore, the twin primes conjecture is true. So lastly, I would just like to say, first of all, thank you for watching. Uh, I hope that this uh, was informative uh, and gave you a good overview of the uh, of the way on which I, I sought to prove the Twin Primes conjecture. Um, and I, I do hope that if this is a topic that interests you, you take a look at the paper uh, and see for yourself uh, how, how I went through this in more detail. Uh, and I also want to thank the people in my life, my friends, my coworkers, my family, all those people who have supported me and listened to me uh, ramble about the progress I have been making and not been making as it happens.
uh, and I appreciate their patience with me and um, just their support uh, helped keep me motivated this whole time. And so, um, yeah, thank you to my family and friends, and all those people, and thank you, the viewer, for watching this video. So until next time, see you later.